the pillow and get a good nap during our time together, or if that just meant the building was really, really cold. I hope it's the latter. Uh, I have to say that uh, I am very excited to be with y'all tonight. Uh, when Brother Sam called me and he said, hey, got this Wednesday night series going on entitled Guess Who I Ran Into, I was like, okay, this sounds really neat. And he said, the specific man that I want you to talk about that you ran into was Fred the Faith Healer. And I was like, really? And he said, yeah. And I'm like, are you sure? And he's like, yeah. And so as I begin to study for this, I hope that you have some note, uh, notebook, paper, pen, something to write on. Because quite frankly, this is a very big subject that the Bible is very clear on. And so the good news is, I hope that you enjoy our time together this evening as much as I've enjo enjoyed the study together. I have to tell you that some of my first experiences with Fred the Faith Healer actually evolved around my wife's cousin. You see, my wife's cousin, uh, two sisters, uh, their mother tragically suddenly passed away. Uh, and they grew up in the, in, obviously in the, the Pentecostal movement, and uh, as these girls who were six and nine years of age at the time, uh, even as to the point that when they went to the funeral, everyone began to tell them, you know, it's okay, once the funeral is over, this makes no sense, but once the funeral is over, we are going to raise your mother from the dead. And so this six and nine year old little girl began to think, okay, we're here at the funeral, but here in just a little bit, mommy's going to get up and mommy's going to go home with us and I can tell you talking with uh, my wife's cousin talking with her because of all the things that happened to them because obviously mommy didn't get up uh, because of all this it has taken them through years and years of counseling it has taken them through a lot of different forms of pain and anguish as they've tried to wrap their mind around their upbringing of what everyone was saying those that their bible class teachers and quote-unquote pastors and, and, and individuals within that realm is causing them a lot of difficulties and so as i begin to think about this i begin to realize that even today my wife and i have a lot of friends that, uh, in fact, one of our friends that my wife works with, uh, her mom supposedly is a Fred the Faith Healer. And so if you think about it, probably more often than not, you, all of us here, know of someone that claims to believe in miracles, claims to believe in the ability to heal other individuals. I have a lot of information. In fact, I've got a lot of examples that I could go over, uh, but quite frankly, I don't have the time. Uh, to look at all these things, but I can tell you there is document after document, book after book, of a lot of these, these so-called faith healers, a lot of these Freds, that, uh, well, they all died, uh, every one of them, and there's a lot of documentation about this. What I want us to look at tonight, though, is I just want us to look squarely at what the Bible has to say about this issue. Uh, there, we could easily, when you have a topic as big as this, we could easily spend a lot of our time looking at what they're doing, looking at what they have to say. But it's kind of like the analogy that I've heard and probably many of you have heard as well about uh, individuals that uh, deal with counterfeit money. These individuals that police to make sure that counterfeiting bills are not being put out into uh, circulation. A lot of them, in fact all of them, do not study all of the errors that are on the counterfeit bills. But instead, they study the real deal. And so that's what I want us to do tonight. And the way my mind works is I like to just ask questions. I like to pose a question, see what the Bible has to say, and hopefully, uh, again, you will learn some things about this. I think the very first place that we need to begin, as we sit down and we talk with Fred the Faith Healers, number one, we need to be able to agree upon what is a miracle. Uh, a lot of times this term miracle is just tossed around flippantly. We see it on the evening news. We see uh, some of our friends say, well, it was a miracle that we got rain over the last couple of days. We need to be able to clarify and come to an agreement on what a miracle actually is. And a miracle is a supernatural act of God over and above natural law. Again, it is a supernatural act of God over and above natural law. For example, the Lord's uh, uh, virgin birth, that's a miracle. But the birth of our children and your grandchildren, that is just part of natural law. Miracles have been defined as, quote, a given transcendent supernatural act 
of God's power. The Bible is very, very clear on what miracles occurred and exactly what they entailed. For example, the Bible talks about how people were raised from the dead. The Bible talks about how real people spoke in real languages that they had never studied, Acts 2. The Bible talks about a miracle being as someone being blind or lame from birth and then totally and instantly healed. That's very important, totally and instantly healed. The Bible talks about how Jesus and Peter walked upon the water. The Bible talks about a miracle being one who was struck blind. The Bible talks about how the Red Sea was parted. The Bible talks about how the axe head floated. The Bible talks about how miracles are, are those that entail lethal snake bites that cause no harm. And we're not talking about those who manipulate the poison glands of venomous snakes, but real venomous snakes that cause no harm. The Bible talks about miracles being those entailing lepers who were instantly and perfectly healed. And as we begin to look at these accounts, biblical accounts of what a real miracle is, and then begin to compare them to what's happening and what Fred the faith healer is doing, there's a huge and wide uh, uh, difference uh, between the two. You see, miracles today do not match these. You know, what we see today is I begin to turn on the religious channels, and I have to say sometimes I do that, um, Sometimes I do it just to get a laugh, even though it's sad. Uh, being able to watch Benny Hinn and some of the different things that he, that he tries to do, it's, uh, it's sad, but it's comical to me that people buy into this. But we begin to see that there is some individual who has a, a, a malady, and, and they come up, and all of a sudden they're, they're said to be better. Right? They, they come up and they have a, a hearing problem. And all of a sudden, they're zapped or pointed at or whatever it may be. And all of a sudden, they can hear much, much better. There are individuals who struggle to walk. And then all of a sudden, they, they get healed. And all of a sudden, they're able to walk a little bit better. But even at that point, they are still not perfectly walking perfectly. Uh, there's individuals that claim that they have cancer. And all of a sudden, that cancer has gone into remission. There are often, though, there are many who say they are healed... But documentation finds that later on, they suffer some type of relapse. Again, there are many documented cases of fraud and deception among those claiming to work miracles. Some have admitted their deception, while others have been proven fakes. Again, as I begin to get on the internet, I begin to see document after document, book after book, in which individuals are coming forward and saying, look, the whole thing was a hoax. The whole thing was a setup, and I did that just to try to convince those individuals that the uh, pastor, quote unquote, is somebody that was more and more spiritual or has specific miraculous abilities. As I began to study scripture, I began to wonder who is it that had the ability to perform true miracles? And all of a sudden, my mind immediately went to Jesus. And as we begin to think about Jesus, and this is important, there were three different types of healings. Three different categories of healings that Jesus Christ himself performed. Number one, we see where he performed physical healing. We can read about, and we'll talk about here in a moment, those individuals that were needed some type of physical help. There was some type of illness. There was some kind of injury, something that was causing them great harm and distress. And so he was able to heal physical uh, healing. Number two, he was able to do demonic deliverance. We can read about Legion there in Mark 5 in which he began to heal him and cast the demons out of him. Demon deliverance. And number three was that of natural phenomena. Natural phenomena. For example, we can read about how Jesus was able to perform miracles such as walking upon the water. I know David Copperfield several years ago began to try that. And uh, with all of his different ma magic stuff and all the things that he did, he supposedly was able to do it. Uh, but Jesus did it without any type of hoax. Jesus was able to do this. Jesus calmed the sea as the turbulences began to go into the swarms and everyone was fearful for their life. We know that Jesus was able to get up and say, peace be still, and he calmed the sea. We know that Jesus was able to feed 5,000 people, and the reason that he did this is so that he could prove that he's the Messiah, that he can prove that he is the Son of God. You see, as we begin to dig a little bit deeper, we begin to notice some very important things about the miracles of Jesus himself. 
we begin to find out in Acts 2.22, we begin to see where Jesus performed these miracles in the presence of people. He did these in the presence of people. A lot of times whenever we run into Fred the faith healer, he has uh, compounds. Uh, in fact, there was one individual in 1965 that had what he called literally the glory barn in which he had his individuals, his uh, followers, that only would heal those individuals within the glory barn. But Acts 2.22 talks about how Jesus was attested to you. As Peter began to speak, attested to you by God with signs and wonders. And so it was something that was done publicly. It was something done in the presence of the people. When Jesus did miracles, they took place simultaneously. It took place simultaneously. In Mark 2 and verse 12, we find where Jesus is there with the, the paralytic. And Jesus says, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And what's important about that is that when Jesus healed the individual, it happened right then. It wasn't this delayed response, which a lot of Fred the faith healers will try to tell us that, oh, it's something that will get better over time. No, it was something that happened right there on the spot. Why? Because Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus, when he performed a miracle, it involved both the cripple, and notice this, and the amputee. In Matthew chapter 15, verse 30, the setting is the feeding of the 4,000. It said that those who were crippled came to see him, and he healed them. But it also talks about those who were lame, those who were amputees. You know, I have to tell you, I would love to see Fred, the faith healer, to be able to go in and see those individuals who's lost an arm, or to be able to go into those huge tents over there in Iraq and Afghanistan and all those other places, individuals that have lost limbs, and for them to be able to come in and to heal those and to restore those. But sadly, it's not happening. But when Jesus did it, it happened because he's the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Number four, we see that when Jesus healed people, it resulted in people being healed completely and holy. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 22, we read about the woman who has been bleeding for 12 years. And as she reached out and touched the hem of his garment, we know that it was a complete healing. It was something that allowed her to be made whole once again. We also find that when Jesus performed a miracle, they were to be beyond dispute. Again, back to Acts 2 and verse 22, and I promise we'll get to a lot of scripture here in a moment. But in Acts 2, verse 22, we find where Peter's sermon there on Pentecost, again, it was out dis without dispute. The Jews, the Pharisees, the scribes, everyone that was there, they knew that these miracles occurred. It was without dispute. Number six, when Jesus performed miracles, they were performed without the faith of the subject. And this is very important. John 5, 1 through 17, I would encourage you to read it. But here we have the man who is sitting by the pool of Bethesda. And he is waiting for someone to come in and to put him into the water because he believed that would heal him of his infirmities. But as Jesus comes up, he says, look, I want you to get up. That man didn't have faith in Jesus. That man didn't even know who Jesus was. But Jesus had the ability to heal that man. Why? Because he's the Messiah, the son of the living God. We know that when Jesus performed miracles, it involved the accurate unveiling of the future. Read Matthew chapter 24, and we see there where he talks about the destruction of Jerusalem. He talked about the, the second coming, the end of times. Jesus, when he did a miracle, it happened just the way that God said that it would, or that he said that it would. And so there's so many things. In fact, we could camp right here and just look at the miracles of Jesus. But Jesus did it because he wanted, uh, or God wanted us to know that he is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. The second group, though, turn with me to Matthew chapter 10 and verse 1. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 1. Because we know that Jesus did miracles. We know that he healed all different types of men and women and children and Lazarus and did all these natural phenomenon. But we find in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 1, where it says, and reading from the ESV, and it says, And he called to him his twelve disciples and gave them the authority over unclean spirits to cast them out. And notice and to heal every disease and every affliction. We find here that the twelve had this ability. We find that as he sent them out, they had the ability to go out and to do some miraculous things. But some things that are different, similar yet different than Jesus, is the apostles, they too had the ability to do physical healing, which also included that of raising individuals from the dead. 
The apostles also, like Jesus, had the ability to cast out demons or to, de to do demonic deliverance. But the one major difference between Jesus and the apostles is the apostles were not able to perform natural phenomenon. Nowhere in Scripture, at least to my study conclusion, do I find where the disciples, where the apostles themselves walked on water. Where I find these individuals that were able to do any of these things that deal, dealt excuse me, with natural phenomenon. But I need everyone to turn to Acts chapter 8. Because in Acts chapter 8, I believe that when we're going to talk with Fred the faith healer, I believe there are two chapters and one passage that we have to understand. Two chapters and one passage that you and I need to understand. Again, as you have the great theme of, of guess who I ran into, of a focus on evangelism, of us being able as, as a church, as a Lord's body, to be able to go out into our community and talk with our families and our friends about the gospel and about truth and about doctrine. We need to understand this if we're going to talk to Fred the Faith Healer. Acts chapter 8, beginning, excuse me, beginning in verse 4. Let me get there myself. All right, Acts 8, beginning of verse 4. It says, Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. And Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds, with one accord, paid attention to what was being said by Philip. Notice this, when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. For unclean spirits, crying out with a loud voice, came out of many who had, who had them, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed, and so there was much joy in the city. What I want you to notice there, and if you're taking notes, is I want you to notice that the manifestation of the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit were evident. The people that were there began to see those that were lame. They began to see that as Peter, or excuse me, as Philip began to cast out demons, they began to see the power of God being manifested through Philip. But all of a sudden, as we move down to verse 13 through verse 19, we begin to read about Simon the magician or Simon the sorcerer. In verse 13, it says, Even Simon himself believed, and after being baptized, he continued with Philip. And after seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. 14, Now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen on any of them, for they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them. Notice that. They laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now verse 18, Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was giving through, what? The laying on of the apostles hands he offered them money saying give me this power also so that any one of whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit some very important observations that we need to understand if we're going to talk with Fred the faith healers we need to understand how the miraculous ability for healing prophecy speaking in languages whatever it may be we need to understand how God gave this ability Okay, we need to understand how God gave this ability. We find in verse 13 that Simon was amazed at the great miracles performed. As I've tried to envision myself there, I have to think that'd be one of the coolest things you could ever see. I mean, I know we get, a lot of, we get excited about a lot of different things today, but I'm telling you, if I was there and I began to see real healings, biblical miracles happening, that would be exciting. I can see myself being like Simon saying, man, this is awesome. This is great. I want to know what it takes so that I can give this to someone else. The second thing I want you to notice is that Peter and John had to come down to Samaria from Jerusalem so that they could receive the miraculous gift of the Holy Spirit. They had to come down. The, the apostles themselves, they had to travel, they had to come down from Jerusalem to Samaria so that they could lay their hands on these individuals that, that were there so that they could impart 
this spiritual gift. Simon said, or saw, excuse me, that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, again, if you mark in your Bibles, I would encourage you to underline that phrase. Through the laying on of the apostles' hands, this gift was given. You see, it's important to note that Philip had the ability to heal. Philip had the ability to cast out demons, but he was unable to pass it along. And so all of a sudden we see where Simon sought to, to buy this gift. And I've heard a lot of different theories on why he wanted to do that. But what Scripture says is that Simon wanted this ability so that he could give it to other people. Now when you read further and you begin to see where Simon is rebuked by Peter and John, we begin to realize, as Scripture states, that his heart was not right. I've heard some preachers say that the reason he wanted this ability is so that he could go sell it from city to city. And there may be some truth to that. But that's not what Scripture says. Scripture says that he wanted to impart this gift to others because the intent of his heart was not right. This is key. This is pivotal. Because here in just a little bit, we're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and chapter 13, which is very, very important. What time do I go to, Sam? Seven something. Awesome. Um... 17, there we go. Uh, and so this is key that we understand that through the laying on of the apostles' hands is how they receive the gift. From my study, and I want to be very clear on this, my study conclusion, non-binding, my study conclusion, is it never became common for anyone and everyone in the church to be able to perform miraculous signs. There is no indication that the evangelist or the prophets, except for a few exceptions, that being a Barnabas, Philip, and Stephen, those very early men, never an indication that preachers during this time had the ability to do these miraculous gifts as far as everyone. And there is certainly no indication that members of the church, the body of Christ, had this ability. It's important to note that these were very unique apostolic gifts. Now, again, I could be wrong, but this is my study conclusion. This is where I'm at as of today. But I have to tell you, you know, I have a son that's about to be four, and I have a daughter that just turned one. And I was talking with him the other day, and I said, Connor, if you had one super, superhero ability, what would it be? And he said, Daddy, I want to be a pirate. And I said, son, you're not understanding my question. I said, if you had one superhuman ability, what would it be? Daddy, I want to be a pirate and I want to sail a ship. And so it made me think a little bit to whenever I was in kindergarten, and maybe you were asked that question as a, as a young lad. Uh, if you had one ability, if you had one supernatural ability, what would it be? You know, I thought about speed. Now, that'd be pretty cool. Right, if you want to get up and see Grandma real quick, just grab the kids and just take off booking it a couple of hundred miles an hour. That'd be pretty cool. You know, I thought about after watching the Avengers, you know, the Hulk and his strength, that's pretty cool. You know, that would be something that I would like to, you know, maybe possibly have. But I have to say that I truly believe, aside from following the path of Solomon, having wisdom and discernment, which is awesome, but I think one of the abilities that I would really want to have is the ability to heal. I lost my father to cancer six years ago. And I saw what he went through. I saw those two and a half years of chemotherapy and how it just ate up his body. I lost my mother-in-law eight years ago. She too died of cancer, lung cancer. The same year I lost my dad, a couple months later, I lost my best friend to brain cancer. I talked to one of my buddies this morning as I was traveling into work. And this past weekend, he lost his mother to cancer. I have the opportunities, as many of you do as well, to be able to go into hospitals and to see those that are sick and afflicted. Two weeks ago, I sat at the foot of a bed of a lady that is 96 years of age. And she can't get out of bed. Her ankles are so brittle that they have actually locked up 
And if she were to try to get out of bed and put any weight on it, it would just crush her ankles. And as she laid there in that bed, and her daughter, who was her caretaker, sat right there in tears about the hardship and the pain and the anguish that she's going through, I knew right there, then and there, that I'd want the ability to heal. Healing is something that a lot of people want. Healing is something that we all that we all choose. You know, as a father of two kids, I can tell you when they come down sick, there's no price I won't pay. There's no distance I won't go. There's nothing that I won't try to try to help them. And so healing is something that, that's very, very important. And it's something that we all long for. And that's why I think it's so important that we understand what the Bible has to say about this important subject. I want us to look at next, what is the purpose of miracles? What is the purpose of miracles? If you have your Bibles, open to 1 Corinthians 14, verse 22. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 22. First Corinthians chapter 14, verse 22. It says, Thus tongues are a sign not for believers, but this miraculous gift of speaking in tongues is a sign for unbelievers. And so, clearly put, it's a sign. It, it, it's something that, that people needed back then, to be able to know that what was being stated was true. The, the things that they were proclaiming, that it was something that came from God directly and not from some other source. And so it's a sign. Number two, the purpose of miracles, according to Mark 16 and verse 20. Mark 16 and verse 20, and it says, And they went out and they preached everywhere, while the Lord worked with them, and notice this, and confirmed the message by accompanying signs. Confirm the message by accompanying signs. We find a similar statement in John 3, verse 2. It says, This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. Not one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And so number one, it's for a sign. But number two, it's for confirmation. You see, this is very, very important. And we're saying it's for confirmation. And so we know that there were individuals that had the ability for prophecy, the ability of, of speaking in tongues or that of languages, but it was that for confirmation and for a sign. Some have asked the question, does God still heal today? And I want to tell you that I believe with every ounce of my being that God still heals today. But the means in which he goes about it is not necessarily through Fred, the faith healer, but it's through God and his working through providence. You see, if God doesn't heal, then why do we pray? You know, there, there's been a lot of situations, and I'm sure if we had the time, we could all share stories and situations in which we have prayed for people. As a church, we get up and the announcement is made about sister so-and-so or brother so-and-so and how they're needing help and they're needing prayer. And so we come together as a body of Christ. We come together as the family of God, and we begin to lift them up to the Jehovah, to the mighty one up above. As the Hebrew word, they had a specific title for God. Talking about the one who heals, right? We lift them up and we have seen God work through our prayers. But it was providentially. I, I'm not aware, and I, I've, I've, I've known Sam quite a while, but I can't see him bringing in Fred the faith healer and having brother and sister come up here for these things to happen. You see, we understand that God can heal, but it's in response to prayer. And so what I want us to do in the time that we have remaining is I find it so incredible about how wise God is. I need everyone, if you would, to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, because where we're going to spend the rest of our time, and I'm just going to tell you what's going to happen. We've got about 10 minutes left, but we're going to spend that 10 minutes looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And you're going to find in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 why we're going to spend time there, because God makes it crystal clear. In fact, I think it's important that as we begin to sit down with Fred the faith healer, what I do is we start in Acts chapter 8, and we look at how this ability was given. We, again, Scripture is clear it was through the laying on of the apostles' hands, but then we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and then 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and at least in my feeble mind, and I'm not the smartest guy in the room, I promise you, uh, but at least within my mind, 
Scripture makes it clear on how has God has all of these things work together. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. Paul says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. Now let me just pause for a moment. Do you think this is important for our culture today? As far as the Fred the Faith Healers, and as far as those speaking in tongues, and those within the charismatic Pentecostal movement, do you, do you think this is something that applies to us today? Man, I think it does. I know it does. What we find here is, again, setting the context, as is, context, is, is Paul is writing this letter. He begins to inject in what we have as our chapters. Here in chapter 12 and verse 13, he begins to talk about miracles. Again, it goes back to Acts 8, laying on through the apostles' hand. What we know from reading chapter 12 and verse 13 is that there were nine spiritual gifts. There were nine miraculous spiritual gifts which were given directly by the Holy Spirit through the laying on of the apostles' hand. The purpose was to reveal and to confirm until the Word of God is revealed and confirmed. Again, as we think about this, we have to understand that they don't have the entire Old Testament, New Testament like you and I have today. So they had to have special things that would help them for the cause of Christ so that the gospel could be taught. And so we see where Paul adds these quote-unquote chapters to his letter because Christians with these spiritual gifts were acting unchristlike. And so again, there were individuals who had nine spiritual gifts or some rendition of them, but they were not acting the way that God would have them to act. But as we look at verses 2 and 3, it says, You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols. However you were led, therefore I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say, quote, Jesus is Lord, except in the Holy Spirit. You see, what Paul is saying here is that these miraculous gifts were given to distinguish true revelation from false revelation. Now, why would that be important? Because, again, we, they didn't have the entire New Testament like we have today. And so all of a sudden you have those who were in the Spirit, who were speaking the very things of Jehovah God, but there were also individuals that said, oh, yeah, well, guess what? I got the Spirit too, and here's what he told me. And so all of a sudden he says, look, God is giving these gifts to certain individuals so that we can know what is true, we can know what is accurate revelation from God himself. If you look in verse 4, it says, Now these are, there, excuse me, now there are variety of gifts, but the same Spirit, and there are varieties of service, but the same Lord, and there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. You see, the problem that were there is not only were there people who were Christians who were acting unchristlike, but there seemed to be this mentality that if there were that those who could had the gifts of speaking in tongues, that they were better than everyone else. Well, look, I can speak in a tongue. I've got the specific language, and therefore I'm more holy or I'm more blessed than you are. But what Paul is saying is that look, there are different gifts, but they are all used to say, to serve the same Lord. He goes on in verse 7, he says, all these gifts are be to be used to build up the body of Christ, that of the church. Now as we look in verse 8, it says, for, for to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit, notice this, to another, gifts. You see the plurality there? Gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues, and these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who uh, apportions to each one individually as he wills. And so all of a sudden in verses 8 through 11, we see where Paul is writing about and describing these nine gifts. But one of the things, again, and I could be wrong on this, but one of the things that I pointed out in verse 9 about the gifts of healing is it seems to imply to me that the specific aspects of healing, that these were some kind of divided gift. And again, I could be wrong, but some kind of divided gift. And so the way I envision it is you have these who are able to do some forms of healing and, and illness. These individuals have the ability to heal those that are lame, and you have another individual who's able to help those 
who can't walk to walk and another individual who comes into contact with those who cannot see, who are blind to be able to see. And so there's these gifts of healing. There were different facets of this ability. But Paul brings it back in verse 11 and says, they all come from the Holy Spirit. Now, go down with me to verse 28. It says, and God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administering, and various kinds of tongues. You see, what Paul is saying here is he discusses ways that Christians are different. Yet he talks about how all of them are important. And I think it's important that we understand today that regardless of our role within the church, regardless of, uh, of, of the uh, abilities that we have, that we all need to understand that all of us have an important job. The individual, and you may be here, the individual that cleans the building, God bless you, you are needed. The individuals that mow the grass, God bless you, you are needed. Brother Sam and others that get up here and preach the Word of God, God bless them, they are needed. Those who teach the children in Bible class, God bless them too, they are needed. We all have a very, very important role, and this was what Paul was stressing. But when he talks about healing in verse 28, I would encourage you, if you're marking your Bible, put a little star there and write Acts 8. Again, we have to understand Acts 8 that this ability of healing, where these, he's talking specifically to those individuals who had their hands laid upon them by the apostles themselves. And I need to go speed up just a little bit because I've got two minutes. In verses 29 and 30, it says, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all possess gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret, but earnestly desire the higher gifts. Underline higher gifts. And I will show you a still more excellent way. You see, no person had all these abilities other than the apostles themselves. But there was no individual that had all nine of these gifts. Again, from my study, no, no, nobody had them all. And so it's important to notice that that's why some individuals had this, and some had that, and some had that. But yet, Fred the faith healer today will claim to have all nine of these gifts at the same time. As you get down to verse 31, we see where he talks about where faith, hope, and love are greater than these miraculous gifts. Now, very quickly, in 1 Corinthians 13, and I'm not going to read the scripture uh, per se, because I've got one minute left. 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1, 2, and 3, Paul shows the necessity of love. Just because you have the gift does not mean you are Christ-like in your actions. Again, there's a problem there. There were individuals that had the gifts, but they were not acting like Jesus. As he gets down to verses 4 through 7, this is very, very common and frequent uh, within wedding ceremonies, but we begin to find the characteristics of love. Love is patient, love is kind, love does not envy. And we begin to get that passage. But as we get to the heart of everything, in verses 8 through 12, we begin to find the eternal permanence of love. In verse 8, he begins to talk about how spiritual gifts, notice this, spiritual gifts are temporary. They're temporary. They were used for a specific amount of time, but, but they're temporary. And the way that he does this is he is, illustrates his truth with three of the gifts, that of prophecy and tongues and knowledge. And as we look at verse 9, we begin to realize that the New Testament was not completely revealed at this point. In fact, I found it interesting that the New Testament was not completed until A.D. 96. And then as we get to verse 10, it refers to the complete will of God for the Christian age that of the New Testament. But you see, when the New Testament is complete, spiritual gifts become obsolete. And so, 10 seconds here. The reason this is important is we need to understand that the apostles laying on the hands is how that ability was given. I don't see any apostles running around today. Therefore, these abilities could not be impressed upon. The second thing is we need to understand that God always intended for them to have a very short shelf life that they were something that was temporary. And because of that, it does not affect us today. However, faith, hope, and love will always remain. I believe that I'm out of time. I uh, appreciate the invitation to be here this evening. 
And uh, if you have any questions, please let me know. But may God bless us all richly as we continue to study his word.